On behalf of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Klingon Institute, I welcome you to this webinar on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, due to technical reasons, we have two different platforms in use. Um, some of the participants are on Zoom, welcome to you. And some of them are, well, the majority actually is on YouTube. Uh, we expect over 100 participants uh, actually. So welcome to you as well. Um, I must admit that the people that have uh, logged into Zoom are the lucky ones today because you can ask questions later on during the discussion round. And I have to make my apologies to the um, YouTube uh, audience because well, one of the many downsides of the pandemic is the less interactive meetings um, and also more limited in time because well, we are all sitting behind our screen and that's not something you want to do the whole day. Um, on the plus side, I have to say, there are also um, quite some international participants today because, well, no traveling involved with the webinar, so participants from all over the world, welcome to you as well. I'm, by the way, Siko van der Meer, I'm a research fellow at the Klingen Institute, and I'm happy to uh, uh, announce two excellent speakers. But first, a little introduction on the content of this webinar. This year, it is 50 years ago that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force. And the treaty is still called a cornerstone of nuclear arms control and non-proliferation. So you could say a very important treaty. This year, through the 2020, we expected also a review conference of the non proliferation Treaty, but because of the pandemic, it has been postponed to next year. Well, this anniversary of a very important treaty, combined with the Netherlands chairing one of the main committees of the uh, uh, review conference of the treaty, was a reason for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Klingon Institute to organize a series of lectures on the non proliferation Treaty this year. We have had uh, some real live sessions in The Hague already, and this is the first webinar because of the pandemic. And today, we will discuss the perspectives of two important nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, their perspectives on the treaty. I expect it to be an interesting discussion because, well, we have seen that quite some bilateral arms control agreements between the United States and Russia are, well, collapsing or on their way to uh, be collapsing. Think of the INF Treaty, think of the New Star Treaty that will expire uh, in, in a few months. And the question today is how both nuclear weapon states look at this non proliferation Treaty. Is it still relevant to them? Um, what are the stakes at the review conference of the non proliferation Treaty? I will not go in detail myself. I will just announce two excellent speakers who will enlighten us into the, uh, the positions of both countries. The first speaker is Thomas Countryman. He is currently chair of the board of the Arms Control Association. And previously he had a, a career of 35 years in the US Foreign Service. And lastly, as acting under Secretary of State and also as Assistant Secretary of State. The second speaker is Sergei Batsanov. He is currently director of the um, Geneva Office of Pukwash. And he has also a long career in the foreign service, a uh, long career also in arms control and disarmament in Moscow, including uh, serving as a Russian ambassador to the Conference of Disarmament. Welcome to you as well, uh, Mr. Countryman, uh, Mr. Batsanov. I'm very happy that you are here. Um, may I ask uh, Mr. Countryman to start your brief presentation on the United States and the Non-Proliferation Treaty? Thank you very much, Seiko, and thank you to the Klingendale Institute for this opportunity. Welcome to the audience in the Netherlands and the US and Russia and around the world. Um, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is the most successful multilateral treaty in history. And I think it is recognized that it succeeded greatly, not perfectly, but greatly successful in preventing the horizontal proliferation of nuclear weapons and preventing dozens of countries from complicating what is already a dangerous international setting of nuclear weapons possessing states. And it is central to US national security interests that the treaty remain credible, viable and respected by countries around the world. That fact, the importance, the central importance of the NPT to US security policy and interests does not change from administration to administration. 
What does change, however, is what the United States is willing to do in order to sustain and promote the success of the treaty. I think there is a clear difference between the current Trump administration and the potential Biden administration in the question of whether or not the importance of the NPT has an influence on what we actually do. There is a tendency in the Trump administration to take the NPT and its existence as a given, as a constant and that US national security policy and in particular nuclear doctrine and spending on nuclear weapons is not constrained or is not even affected by the existence of the NPT and the views <clears throat> of the other states that are parties to the NPT. A democratic administration, whether the Obama administration under which I served or a potential Biden administration on the other hand, is more likely to see the reality that the credibility of the NPT and the support of the rest of the world for its continued viability is in part dependent upon the actions that the United States takes. And therefore the United States has to have some consideration for the views of the rest of mankind in developing its nuclear policy, if it wants the continued success of the NPT. Now, Siko, you mentioned the review conference, which has been postponed until January of next year. There is, I think, a good practical reason to postpone it further, which is I could not guarantee New York will be a safe place in January, four months from now. There's also a good political reason to postpone it, to have it occur not in <clears throat> during a transition from one president to another potentially, but to have it occur later when either a Biden administration or a second Trump administration could be better prepared and the world could be better prepared for the US position in the conference. Let me note that the usual definition among my old diplomatic colleagues about the success of the review conference uh, and a, a conference that occurs only once every five years is that it is successful if there is an, an outcome document, a consensus document among all the parties. I've never agreed with that definition. I think there have been in the history of these review conferences more than one type of document and more than one kind of success. And in my view, failure to reach a single consensus document is not necessarily a disaster for the treaty. But I do agree that trying to get to a consensus document on the major issues affecting the treaty is a worthwhile goal that we ought to strive for. And you would find more willingness to seek a consensus document, more flexibility from a Biden administration than you should expect from uh, the Trump administration. So with that in mind, let's, let me describe just a couple of the issues that will be central at the review conference whenever it is held. <clears throat> and not surprisingly, a major part of the atmosphere, of the prospects for success at the conference will depend upon the interaction between the Russian Federation and the United States. And specifically, if Russia and the United States have before February of next year extended the New START Treaty, the last and the most important of the bilateral treaties between the two powers that is still in effect, that will help to set a positive tone for the conference. Conversely, if the treaty has been allowed to expire, then I think both countries, but particularly the United States, will come under strong criticism from the rest of the world, and it will be damaging to the credibility of both countries, but more damaging to the credibility of the United States if New START is no longer in place 
and if the conditions have been laid for a renewed nuclear arms race, one that would be more expensive and more dangerous than what we saw during the Cold War. Similarly, in most of the major international conferences over the last few years, the American and Russian delegations have taken to escalating rhetoric, to hurling accusations against each other as to who is more responsible for the decay and erosion in international arms control agreements. And while diplomats from both countries score points back in their capitals for being tough in their rhetoric, I think they seldom realize how much it damages the overall atmosphere and the credibility of both parties. And so if we see a continuation of that kind of bilateral spitting contest between the two, it will further damage the chance for a successful outcome that would boost the credibility of the treaty itself. Another important factor that is dependent upon Moscow and Washington is whether they've moved beyond New START extension and have initiated a serious process of bilateral consultations leading to nuclear risk reduction, leading to some form of negotiation on new arms control treaties. I would expect that to be a high priority of the Biden administration. The way that the Trump administration has approached this with unrealistic expectations about what Moscow and Beijing are willing to do, do not give me confidence that in a second Trump term, there could be some serious bilateral negotiations such as we're familiar with from the past. The other point where both Moscow and Washington uh, face a credibility gap is in their interpretation of Article 6 of the treaty. Article 6 demands that the five recognized nuclear weapon states, US, Russia, France, China, Britain, uh, work in good faith to the, towards the reduction and elimination of nuclear weapons. It is fundamental to the treaty. It is the part that got more than 100 other countries to promise to forego nuclear weapons. And yet the United States today is unable to repeat a statement that has been made by every president since 1970 onward. That is that Article 6 is a legally binding obligation on the United States, which is a fact under our constitutional system. We have an obligation to pursue a reduction in nuclear weapons. And yet it's no longer possible for US administration officials to repeat this simple fact. It further damages the credibility of the United States and reflects, I think, this administration's lack of interest in the success of the treaty and the success of <clears throat> the review conference. The other issue of credibility that is important and is probably not discussed enough is what is the nature of commitments made at an NPT review conference. When consensus is reached on a final document, all the parties to the treaty agree to certain commitments. These are things that we are going to do in the next five years. The United States <clears throat> has been more clear recently that it regards those previous commitments as simply political declarations without a legally binding nature. And in fact, they are ephemeral. They essentially disappear the day after the consensus document is reached. Uh, that doesn't necessarily change completely under a Biden administration, but it is a reason that other countries doubt the credibility of the United States in its approach to the treaty, in its approach to the review conference. Now, there's several other issues that we could talk about, and I look forward to any questions on these. Those are what are the role of the P5 under the coordination of the United Kingdom? What role can they play at the review conference? There are contentious issues related to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons related to the Middle East zone. 
I think all of those issues can be addressed, particularly if the president of the conference starts working on them and working on consensus language even before the conference begins. But I think all of them are secondary to some of the fundamental questions, some of the fundamental doubts that the rest of the world has about the approach of the United States. Let me leave it there. I look forward to hearing what Sergei sees from Moscow. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, very uh, brief, but very, um, um, let's say, tour of uh, analysis of the situation. Uh, I heard the word credibility a lot, credibility of the MPT, credibility of the United States, credibility of Russia. Um, Sergei, do you also want to enlighten us on the credibility of Russia, the MPT, and the US maybe? Thank you. I think, uh, sorry, I was trying to uh, unmute myself. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, but I don't hear you anymore for some reason. Um, well, um, first of all, many thanks to you, Siko, to Klingendale, and also to the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing uh, this event and for inviting us. Uh, second, uh, my comments, of course, uh, are not uh, in any way or should not in any way be seen uh, or understood as uh, pronounced on behalf of the Russian government. I am not part of it, although I, was, I had been part of it for many, many years, as you said. Uh, and therefore, it's not, it's not an official presentation of what the Russian government thinks or does. Uh, secondly, um, I would allow myself to go, uh, since we are talking about uh, NPT and its importance, uh, to go 50 years ago and maybe a bit more than that, to uh, remember uh, what the big uh, strategic or geopolitical uh, conditions were then in existence that allowed to conclude uh, the uh, non-proliferation treaty, which is, of course, or which has become uh, a cornerstone of non-proliferation, a foundation for uh, decades uh, of uh, arms control and disarmament efforts, especially in the nuclear area, but I think by extension uh, even wider than that. Uh, especially by uh, the United States and at that time the Soviet Union and now Russia uh, bilaterally, but again, uh, more than uh, it was a bilateral effort. Uh, for example, um, the successful conclusion of the uh, CTBT, the Nuclear Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, which was successfully uh, issued, negotiated in 1996, it was something uh, really a multilateral product coming out uh, from the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It was uh, a requirement uh, to conclude such a uh, CTBT there. Uh, and compare uh, the situation that prevailed then with what we have now. Um, in order to uh, maybe help in a way to understand uh, how the situation looks uh, today. So then we had, uh, beginning from the late 1950s and early 1960s, a gradual development, uh, beginning of the development of the perception in the United States and in the Soviet Union of mutual vulnerability. Uh, and from there, I think uh, we can draw a line to the realization uh, of the need to do something to control at least the nuclear arms race and to avoid the most uh, destabilizing uh, results or consequences of it. Uh, the other thing was that um, this nuclear arms race has already 
well, probably together with uh, some other things, has probably shown how tragically dangerous certain situations can uh, become. And the best example for that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Another uh, element strengthening the same line towards the need to start uh, serious arms control uh, and uh, nuclear disarmament measures. Uh, the treaty uh, was negotiated basically in two years, 66, uh, 60, 1966, 1968, entered into force in uh, 1970. And uh, at that time, uh, of course, uh, both uh, superpowers who were in a position to collectively, especially if they agree uh, on something, to uh, control uh, serious international processes, uh, were both uh, quite concerned about the prospect of appearance of uh, additional nuclear states. At that time, by mid-1960, uh, we had uh, five of them. Uh, and the uh, rather commonly expressed concerns were that uh, over the period of 10, 20, maybe years, uh, we would arrive at the number of 20, 25 uh, nuclear weapon states. Uh, and the problems and complications that would follow I think were, if not in detail, but in general sense, which was more important, uh, obvious to many. As a result of the treaty, of the existence of the treaty, and of the regime, uh, no, a wider non-proliferation regime, which grew up from this uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, the actual additions uh, to the nuclear club were five. So five original, five additional. Uh, with one uh, country which did develop uh, its own nuclear weapons uh, program and nuclear weapons themselves, reversed the course, uh, I'm talking about South Africa, and rolled back uh, on its own initiative, which is important. But uh, here the treaty, I think, played a role uh, as a import very important uh, legal and political yardstick, uh, which was already in existence. Uh, so we had only four additional nuclear weapon states, and uh, among them uh, also North Korea, which, by the way, in the mid-60s did join the treaty and later uh, exited it. So again, the treaty was playing a useful role, but uh, given a particular situation, it was probably not sufficient and not very well followed by uh, the important countries which uh, had uh, power, influence, uh, to work with North Korea on a particular crisis situation which developed. Uh, so these uh, new possessors, uh, time-wise, in the order of the appearance, were apparently uh, Israel, although nobody can say exactly when Israel had its uh, first nuclear weapon or a rude nuclear explosive device, then India and Pakistan, uh, and then uh, the already mentioned uh, North Korea as the uh, new possessors. Um, so in that sense, uh, looking back at how the treaty functioned, I think um, both the Soviet Union and Russia, which continued the Soviet Union role in terms of possessing nuclear weapons, uh, could be uh, rather satisfied. Uh, in particular, uh, sorry, I have to do something with the phone. Uh, in particular, uh, when the treaty uh, was not yet in place, and even before negotiations, uh, Soviet concerns were about uh, possible possession uh, or possible acquisition of nuclear weapons by then the Federal Republic of Germany, um, 
and that didn't happen and those fears uh, laid down to rest to a large degree with the Federal Republic of Germany following a certain course and then with the United Germany uh, also continuing to be an active uh, pro-NPT uh, member of the international community. Um, initially, the, no, the whole idea of non-proliferation uh, for the Soviet Union was uh, not necessarily the prevention of the spread of possession, but uh, only, uh, also uh, the prevention of uh, geographic, wider geographic deployment of nuclear weapons. And uh, here, uh, the appearance of the very, very old Polish proposal in the uh, 50s about uh, creating in Central Europe the zone of free of nuclear weapons should also be remembered as an example of Soviet concerns. Uh, it is uh, worth noting that the NPT itself uh, does not contradict the idea of uh, creating nuclear weapon free zones in various countries. Actually, it supports it. And we have seen a series of nuclear weapon free zones uh, around the globe. In fact, uh, I, I think it would be correct to say that most of the world's territory is also covered, in addition to NPT, uh, with uh, regional arrangements designed to ensure the absence of nuclear weapons in the territory of uh, participating states. We have nuclear weapon free zone in Latin America, in Africa, in uh, South Pacific, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we even have uh, one country which declared itself a nuclear weapon free zone, and that is uh, Mongolia. And, so, uh, and of course, we have nuclear weapon free zone in Central Asia, uh, which is also uh, maybe not a very direct, but still a result of the NPT. Uh, again, for many reasons, Russia today should be uh, quite happy with the NPT. Uh, as far as I can judge, the Russian uh, position on NPT continues to be very solidly uh, in favor of strengthening the treaty as it uh, both uh, respects, reflects and promotes Russian uh, national security interests. Now, but still something changed uh, in the meantime. Uh, before uh, addressing the current challenges, I would like, I think, to notice uh, uh, one more uh, element here, which is relevant to NPT, because when uh, the Soviet Union ceased to exist uh, in late uh, 1991, uh, its role as a depository of the NPT, as uh, quote unquote, uh, recognized, uh, NPT recognized uh, possessor of nuclear weapons uh, trans uh, were transferred to the Russian Federation. Uh, it was uh, also in a way a success of the NPT because in such a dramatic and consequential change in uh, geopolitics, the proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, did not occur. Uh, and I think it was uh, a result of very diligent handling uh, of the issue by the then nuclear weapon states recognized by the NPT, uh, including Russia, but also by uh, the former Soviet republics, which happened to have uh, Soviet nuclear weapons on their territory at, at that time. Today, we do not have uh, the duopoly of uh, two superpowers, quote unquote, governing the world. Uh, in Russia, we call uh, the current situation as evolution towards multipolarity. 
in other countries, including in the United States, many people, probably not everyone, but many people, call it um, rivalry against uh, and rivalry and competition against major powers. That is bringing additional risks to stability. Uh, the, in this new situation, and that is what is of uh, concern to me, um, there is a tendency in a number of capitals to uh, address uh, those specific situations that arise from the point of view of net gain, political or geopolitical gain or loss, with less attention being paid to uh, the impact on the NPT and the non-proliferation regime. There is a particular risk in my view that um, we have another competition um, that is in weapons sales, uh, which uh, big producers, global producers and uh, uh, sellers of nuclear, uh, of, uh, of course not nuclear weapons, sorry. Uh, of uh, weapons um, conduct, selling uh, more and more very sophisticated conventional uh, weapons uh, to different countries and different regions, which also can further uh, erode uh, regional stability and become a factor uh, of um, renewed interest uh, in nuclear weapons. I am hearing uh, a number of um, suggestions or comments, not yet from the mainstream uh, security community or, ma uh, or mainstream media, but still. Uh, for example, about uh, the desirability of certain countries um, which do not have a particularly good relation with one or another uh, so-called big power competitor, be it China or Russia in the case, they, uh, to maybe be given nuclear weapons by somebody in the West uh, or to be encouraged to have nuclear weapons. Uh, again, here, uh, people are forgetting about the overall st stabilizing uh, role being played by the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, in order not to take more of your time, I think I, uh, or think I feel I should uh, agree, uh, for the record, with uh, I think most of all that Tom Countryman said and which I did not touch upon. Um, he uh, expressed concerns about uh, this kind of uh, lack of readiness uh, on the part of the current US administration uh, to uh, reach compromise, compromises to give away uh, some other, uh, let's say, aspirations or positions in order to support uh, the NPT and its uh, standing uh, in the world. I think this is uh, also to an extent uh, happening uh, in other countries and to a certain extent, but probably to a lesser extent uh, in the Russian Federation. Uh, several years ago, we in Russia had a phenomenon of um, what uh, people elsewhere and a certain group of uh, us Russians uh, defined as nuclear uh, saber uh, rattling, uh, where people mostly uh, not really uh, authorized to speak on uh, nuclear doctrinal uh, aspects um, started competing with one another, uh, stressing the need uh, or stressing the importance of Russian nuclear arsenals, 
threatening countries for absolutely unclear and understandable reasons with potential Russian nuclear strikes and so on and so forth. Uh, I think we more or less uh, put this trend under control. Uh, but again, uh, I am not completely uh, sure, completely convinced to what extent uh, in terms of real day-to-day uh, -day politics, there is a concern about the, let's say, future and sustainability of the NPT. The official position remains, of course, NPT uh, is a great treaty, should be continued, should be strengthened, etc., etc., etc. But uh, in everyday decisions, I do not always uh, see a good uh, degree of respect to this uh, official pol uh, policy line. Uh, as regards to the review conference, again, I agree with practically everything uh, Tom said. Uh, I would like to add maybe that we have uh, several areas of risk. One is the situation with the nuclear arms race. Uh, another is uh, the two crises that we have uh, on our hands, uh, which are directly related to the NPT and nuclear non-proliferation. One is North Korea. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a chance at least to put in motion a good process of addressing that problem, not doing everything just in one go or in one meeting, but working on uh, bringing uh, North Korea back into the NPT eventually, as a non-nuclear weapon state, of course. And the other is with Iran, which again, it was in uh, 2015, five years ago. We thought that everything uh, was okay. We have concluded the JCPOA, uh, Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action, uh, unique agreement uh, of recent diplomacy. But now the, we are at risk of losing this unique agreement, a uh, very new tool. Uh, and I don't know what will happen for, uh, as a result, but certainly uh, these elements do not work well for the uh, NPT review conference now due next year. I think I okay. should stop. May I ask you to wrap up in two minutes? Sorry? No, no, no. I, I said I think I should stop on that. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. That was, that, that was my last sentence. Sorry for interrupting your last sentence. <laughs> so, thank, thank you also for diving into history, because indeed we should not forget that the NPT is not only an important issue now, it has been an important issue for decades, and there's a lot of history that we should take into account as well with the current situation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I had prepared a, a question to you both myself, but I see in the chat function that someone else uh, asked this question as well, so I will not ask any questions. We have um, uh, some 20 minutes left for a discussion. There are, uh, we have a, a select group in the Zoom meeting. Unfortunately, as I said, only they uh, are able to ask questions uh, uh, now. I would invite them all to um, um, ask a question uh, to one or both of, of the speakers. You can use the raise hand function or you can use the chat function, the question and answer function. Um, I will... Um, 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 give you the floor. Um, uh, I would first of all also encourage the younger people in the public also to ask your questions. Um, it's online so we can't eat you so please also uh, don't be afraid and, and ask your questions. And I ask anyone I give the, the floor or the mic in this case, uh, please briefly introduce yourself so the speakers and the audience knows who is speaking and um, if, if important what affili affiliation you have. Um, and one last thing, please keep your question to a brief question and not a big statement, uh, because, well, we have a lack of time during these kind of online meetings. Um, uh, the first person I, I saw asking my question, actually, is uh, Peter Buys. Peter, could you unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? 
I will. Thank you very much, Chico. Thank you for this webinar and thanks uh, above all for the two excellent speakers for a, a, a question not you, uh, known to the broader public, but very relevant for the future of our world. And I want to ask both uh, speakers, uh, what role do you think the Dutch government could play in general on nuclear disarmament, being a, a small, tiny country, a NATO member, 20 nuclear warheads, US on our soil? And especially, what role can uh, the, the, the Dutch government play uh, in the, during the REFCON and the preparation of the REFCON, uh, being vice chair of uh, the REFCON itself? And the second question, what role do you think physicians could play? Because I'm the chair of the uh, Dutch affiliate of IPPNW, International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, getting the Nobel Peace Prize in 85 for uh, giving Reagan and Gorbachev the ultimate arguments that they had to go to the table to negotiate because of the big uh, medical humanitarian risks uh, nuclear weapons bear in itself. And no uh, nuclear weapon state can guarantee that nothing when shall go wrong. That's the, the big uncertainty. So at any moment, something can go terribly wrong. That was uh, my question to both uh, speakers. All right. Well, yeah, um, I'll take a crack at Peter's question. Siko, I, I note that there are a couple of good questions on the Q&A function on Zoom which are probably not visible to the people on YouTube. Uh, so with your permission, I might uh, tackle a couple of those questions uh, after I answer Peter's. Well, um, maybe, maybe Tom, it would be a good idea to maybe ask those people first, or you can combine the answers. Maybe that's a more um, um, formal way to do it. Is that a good option that we collect some questions and then you can answer many questions at once? No, oh, as you wish. What do you want me to do right now? Take Peter's I, question. I will ask the other people that are in the chat to ask that question. So you can collect the questions a little bit and maybe also um, combine and the, 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 the okay. answers to, into them. Is that OK? Sure. I will ask um, uh, Hugo Klein. Can you mute yourself? <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll stick to just one question because by the time of this REFCON, whether it will take place in January or later, there will be 50 ratifications of the ban treaty. And I guess these countries will want some positive language about this accomplishment during the REFCON and nuclear powers will not be amused. So my question was, to what extent is this going to be a further complication of an already difficult REFCON? Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Um, also, Hans, I don't know your, your surname, but uh, Hans, the floor is yours. Um, well, I'm, I don't have uh, a particular question. Um, I mostly agree with uh, Peter Beuys because I'm also from the NGMP, the Dutch affiliate of uh, IBPNW. So, um, uh, speaking from the Dutch point of view, of course, it's very interesting what uh, the role of uh, our small country could, could be, eh? being a Dutchman, upcoming uh, elections. Uh, well, it's very important. Uh, uh, what could we give advices to our political parties, for, for example, because they are now very open for our uh, advices, uh, I, I would say so. so now is the time to get uh, nuclear weapons the issue on the political uh, uh, agendas of the po political parties so and uh, this could also uh, raise uh, this issue uh, between uh, the the people in the netherlands uh, more on a, on a, on, a, on a bigger forum because uh, when you talk about nuclear we weapons it's still a bit a bit hidden issue it's not a real a, a big topic so now is the time to get this uh, much more uh, dis discussion uh, about it. Thank you, Hans. Uh, now I recognize you without showing him in, 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 the, in the screen. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, a relating question, I think, is of Bob Day, now saw in the chat, uh, on, on, the chat on, on the topic that is not really live among the bigger public. Uh, Bob, would you enlighten us on your question? 
Yes, uh, thank you very much, Seiko. I mean, we were discussing this last week on why there is not more pressure from below on policymakers to take nuclear arms control seriously. Because if you look in the Netherlands, people take to the streets for all kinds of things, from you know government nitrogen regulations to uh, climate change, to even plastic bags. But you very rarely see demonstrations now, as we saw in the 80s, about nuclear weapons. Um, so why is there not much more societal debate? And is there anything, maybe to follow up on Thomas's response to, to my question in the chat, are there new ways we can maybe attract a bit more attention to this topic, given how serious it is? Thank you. Um, Thomas, do you want to um, combine and write quite some answers into one answer? Uh, sure, it put it all into one short answer. It's really hard. Okay. <laughs> Let me expand a little bit on those answers. Uh, first, the role of the Netherlands as a important, loyal, and consistent member of the NATO alliance. It's important for the Netherlands to participate in the policy debate, not just about NATO's military policy and NATO's nuclear policy, but about, about how Western nations, the European Union, NATO states, can approach the crucial issues that will be discussed at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. And here it is important that the Netherlands be not simply one of a chorus, but that it seek to be a leader in creative ideas on the hardest questions between the United States and the Russian federations there are no good creative ideas coming from either the Russian government or the US government. But there is the possibility for addressing some European security issues if there are creative ideas coming from NATO states. And I look to the Netherlands to be a leader in that regard. Uh, Peter, you and I have discussed many times the role of physicians, the important role they have played uh, in raising consciousness there is so much competition today for the public attention of uh, European, American, and other publics that it's hard to get a word in edgewise about nuclear weapons. We're concerned with pandemics, with immigration, with neo-fascist parties seeking to gain control or having gained control of governments. Uh, and there is a lot to worry about and doctors in particular have more immediate topics such as the pandemic. And yet there remains the potential for concerned group of citizens to find more effective ways to raise concern about the existential risk uh, that nuclear weapons pose to the existence of the human species. In terms of uh, uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Ban Treaty. It is possible that that treaty will have entered into force before we get to a review conference. Now, what does that mean for the United States? Again, difference between a Trump administration and a potential Biden administration. The Trump administration says the NPT is important, takes it for granted, finds the prohibition treaty to be obnoxious and must battle against it at every point. A Biden administration thinks the NPT is important, does not take it for granted, cares about what the rest of the world thinks about US policy, but also finds the prohibition treaty obnoxious uh, and detrimental to a greater effort that, the, that a Biden administration would try to lead on non-proliferation. What I think is rather uh, different, and that is that the prohibition treaty is not inconsistent with the NPT. It is not immediately relevant to the NPT. It is an aspirational treaty that will have greater importance in the future, but does not need to be and should not be a reason for an argument or a dispute within the NPT membership or at the review conference. Um, there, it is possible to note the existence of the NPT, 
without making a judgment one way or another about it. So I would hope that grown-ups at the review conference would take that approach. Last comment, there's a question in the chat uh, about whether there are more nuclear power wannabes out there and whether the NPT, since it failed to contain India and Pakistan, uh, can it be counted on to contain other countries? My answer is yes. There are countries that, there are many countries that have the capability and the materials to build nuclear weapons, but as members of the NPT are not moving in those directions. There are countries that are trying to get that capability, such as Iran. We had a effective agreement to close down that pathway for Iran. The US has violated the JCPOA. That doesn't mean Iran is anywhere close to a nuclear weapon. We have countries that like to talk tough, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, that don't have the immediate capability to make nuclear weapons. So my short answer is I am less concerned about the horizontal proliferation of nuclear weapons to new countries than I'm concerned by the vertical proliferation the new arms race that the US and Russia like to threaten each other with. Uh, and I believe the tools of the NPT and the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy, are able to address the risk of horizontal proliferation. Not that we ever take our eyes off it. You have to pay attention to it all the time, but it is not my primary concern right now. Thank you for combining a lot of answers in one uh, very clear answer. Uh, a lot to worry about, as you said, indeed. So that's not very optimistic, but you're right. Uh, Sergei, do you also want to get some answers together? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think very good questions, different questions. Um, I'm sort of hesitant to, let's say, uh, give public advice about what uh, the Dutch government should be doing or not doing. Uh, but uh, still um, a little bit uh, following what Tom had to say, I think uh, one should pay attention to several peculiar aspects of the current situation, which uh, complicate the search for uh, imaginative uh, and good political solutions. One of that uh, aspects that characterize the today's situation is uh, the dramatic lack of uh, dialogue on different levels uh, among different groups. And even when uh, certain events which can be described as, as dialogue do take place. Uh, they uh, are conducted in a kind of a haphazard uh, way. A short meeting of one or, or two days, something discussed, something immediately aired in a propagandistic way or released, and then what? And then very little. Uh, we need to uh, think about uh, renewed uh, engineering of uh, discussions and contacts at different level, be it between the two major uh, nuclear states, Russia and the Soviet, uh, and the United States, be it uh, in a wider context, let's say, to discuss the European situation. So engineering that discussion, it is, uh, in my view, uh, a very important thing. Now, maybe it uh, might be difficult, or, or there can be certain difficulties uh, about doing so, given the fact that um, there are other uh, international political issues that um, are dividing, let's say, uh, Russia and NATO, Russia and uh, at least a number of uh, West European countries. And here comes what, what comes to my mind in this sense is how in the past 
the uh, NPT and its system, its, its wider regime, uh, succeeded in being a, well, not uniting factor, but a factor that allowed uh, Moscow and Washington to uh, concentrate on nuclear non-proliferation and arms control while on several other or in several other areas the relations were uh, also quite dismal uh, and uh, in certain situations npt discussions that we we used to have with the americans uh, were uh, the only channel of uh, communication on nuclear military strategic uh, aspects not only of uh, our situation our bilateral relations but also uh, allowing us to compare notes how we see the world how we see uh, emerging uh, dangers and risks and so on and so forth this is not happening and somebody i think needs to help the two countries to re uh, learn to do that the other thing is that um, uh, in an uh, evolving multipolar world, the um, talks just between uh, Russia and the United States, although it is still of primary, they are, they are still of primary importance, given the fact that the two countries possess more than 90% of nuclear arsenals uh, of the world. Uh, there is a need to think better how to widen this uh, circle of discussions on what issues and so on and so forth. The uh, current US administration made an, an attempt to do that, uh, but in my view, in a very clumsy way, by declaring that China should join as a condition for the extension of uh, the new start, uh, when uh, the first meeting was about to open in Vienna between the Russian and American delegations, somehow the Chinese flags appeared, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are reasons to think about how to involve China, but not in, let's say, the center stage uh, start negotiations or st start agreement between the US and Russia, and not in such a clumsy way. But a much more elegant way, in my view, uh, is to um, promote the idea of um, negotiations uh, in the context of P5. There is logic to that. The platform, maybe not in the right shape, uh, already exists. But what worries me that there is almost complete silence when uh, people discuss a lot about China and discuss very little about the UK and France, as if, as if they do not exist as possessors of nuclear weapons. Uh, and here I think that maybe uh, some of their friends in Western Europe uh, might consider talking to them and saying that, uh, well, they should probably be more in the open on this and not just coordinating uh, or taking part in the development of uh, terminology, vocabulary of nuclear terminology and so on and so forth. Uh, I think there is a need to do more. Uh, and on um, the role of the civil society, yes. Uh, compared to what we could observe in 1980s, today uh, the situation reflects uh, almost, well, very little activity. Maybe the times are different. Maybe uh, something changed in this world about uh, ability of civil society to act uh, and do something, uh, or maybe something is uh, connected 
with the funding the civil society is receiving to address certain issues and not the others. I'm not, I'm not a specialist on how civil society works. But uh, in any case, I think it is an important uh, reservoir uh, in creating a political climate more uh, favorable for re or more demanding, uh, perhaps that's the better word, uh, in terms of restarting uh, efforts to reduce the, the nuclear risk, to understand the evolution of the nuclear risk in the new situation, and they are evolving, they are multiplying. Um, and I'm coming back to what uh, I've started from, and re-establishing and helping re-establish uh, systemic uh, dialogue on security, arms control, non-proliferation, and uh, re uh, disarmament uh, aspects among, uh, first of all, the two biggest possessors, but, all, but also in a wider circle. Thank you. Tom, you want to add a, a, a short thing and show your hand, or? If you say we have time for two more minutes, yes. Two more minutes. Okay. Uh, there's another good question on the Q&A function, which is about the risk of nuclear terrorism. If a terrorist organization were able to acquire a nuclear device, isn't this a bigger risk? Uh, my answer is it is an important risk that we have to take seriously. It was a priority of the Obama administration to have a series of nuclear security summits at which all the countries of the world worked to lock down fissile material to make sure that there would not be available to any terrorists the enriched uranium or plutonium to make a nuclear device. And so although there is without question, there are terrorists that would like to get their hands on a nuclear weapon and would use it if they had it, uh, the risk of that happening, I honestly think, is much less than it was 12 years ago. You can't take your eyes off of it. This is why I worry about others. Uh, I don't know if all of you can see the screen sharing. These are the nine men, and of course they are all men, who have their fingers on the nuclear buttons of their respective countries. And any one of them, by himself, could initiate a nuclear war that potentially leads to the extermination of the human species. A single terrorist can't do that. They could cause a lot of havoc and they'd like to. But any of these nine gentlemen could cause the elimination of humankind. And we have had situations of false alarms that have brought us there before. I don't wanna tell you how many of these gentlemen I trust to act in the world's best interest in the middle of a crisis. I can tell you it's less than half, but let me not be more precise. <laughs> That's what we need to worry about. And it is the rhetoric and the actions of these leaders that public pressure needs to dial back. Thank you, Thomas, for this uh, sharing the, 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 the pictures of the men that are really decision makers in this respect. And well, also a bit of a pessimistic warning you give for less than half of them that are capable to deal with a big crisis. Um, yes. Of course. I, I would love to discuss for several more hours on the topic, but what well, we can't, we decided we had to stop at uh, four o'clock and it's already past four o'clock. Well, we are all at our, uh, watching at our screen, so it's healthy to stretch our legs again. Um, I, I learned a lot during this meeting, um, so, some pessimistic remarks uh, that make me worried, uh, but also some optimistic parts. Uh, I think it's uh, nice to hear that from both the US and Russian perspective, the MPT is still the cornerstone of international arms control and operation. So it's not yet language like the, uh, some countries talk about the an INF or New START uh, treaty. So that's something positive we can take with us, I think. 
Um, but uh, as uh, you both said, um, it, it's hard and we need creative ideas, we need dialogue, as, as Sergei uh, um, emphasized, that's really important. Um, because of the time, I, I, I have to, uh, to end the discussion. Also, I'm sorry for the participants who asked questions that have not been answered. I want, first of all, to thank you, the both speakers, uh, Thomas and, and Sergei. Thank you for your time to enlighten us about the, the, the viewpoints from your uh, respective countries that you're not representing, as Sergei said, but you know what's happening there very well, I think. So thank you for that. I also want, to, want to, to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands for enabling this webinar, and of course to the participants, anyone who took time to listen to this debate and to ask questions as well. Last remark, uh, this webinar will be available um, on the Klingendam YouTube channel soon. And of course, we hope to see you all um, soon again during any future events online, but I really hope also in real life as well. So thank you all. and. Goodbye.